All right. Notice in verse 1 of Genesis chapter 3, it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. Right here, of course, right in the beginning of the Bible, we see sin introduced, we see Satan introduced, and we see a few things about Satan here and his influence and how he ends up getting the human race to fall. And what I want to talk about tonight is satanic influences in the churches. And you know, and this message, I promise I'm probably not going where you think I'm going to go with this message. Okay? Because when you think of Satanism, and when you think of something that is satanic or satanic influences, you know, what is it that we usually picture? You know, we usually picture some pretty crazy stuff straight out of a horror movie, don't we? And because, you know, we've been conditioned by Hollywood, you know, we've been influenced by these things. And we do, you know, when you think of the Church of Satan, you know, you do, you think of some, you know, crazy looking dude up in a black robe and just all evil looking and vampire teeth and, you know, blood. And you, you think of all kinds of crazy, horrible, gory things. But if we actually look in the Bible at how Satan operates and how Satan works, it's nothing like we see in, you know, the Church of Satan today. It's a absolutely not like that at all. You know, I, I'm, years ago, I got Bill Schnoblin's book, uh, Lucifer Dethroned, and I remember I was reading that. I was at home by myself one night, and I was reading that book, and man, I got freaked out. You want to talk about something straight out of a horror movie? And this was a man that was in Satan. He was involved in Satanism, and you know, let me just say a few things about Bill Schnoblin. All right, that was an interesting book. I remember I really enjoyed it. Very entertaining, scary stuff. And I remember after I read that book. I ended, up, I ended up looking them up online, and this was before YouTube was real big and stuff. I don't remember where this video was. I mean, it wasn't on YouTube where I found a video of him, but I found this long video where he was on there basically telling his story and stuff. And when I saw the guy, I was so disappointed because the guy just looked like a total freak show. And I'm just like, this guy's a weirdo, <laughs> you know? And I, I, a while back, I was watching some videos with him. And you know what? I'm going to show you. By the end of this message, too, I want to point something out. I think that guy's still into Satanism, if you ask me. You say, how could you say that about this guy? You know, he's saved. He's trusted in Jesus Christ. When you actually study Satanism, or not study Satanism as far as, but Satan in the Bible, and how he works, and then you look at guys like Bill Schnobel and what he's doing today, I think the guy's still involved in Satanism. Say, so that's a terrible thing to say. Well, let's look at what the Bible actually says. And I think, you know, I think you'll probably agree with me, especially when you see some of the goofy stuff this guy's involved in. So first off, with, when it comes to Satan, okay, because when we think about the church of Satan or when we think about satanic things, if, I went, if you went into a church and, you know, they got that rock music going, you know, we think of that as satanic often, don't we? But when you stop and think about it, that's not, I wouldn't call that satanic. You know, just some of these, you know, when you go into a church and you, uh, you know, some of these tongue-talking churches where the people seem like they're possessed yeah. of a devil, all right? A lot of times we might say that that would be satanic. But you know what? I don't think that's satanic either. Now, I do think it's demonic, and there's a difference, and I'll show you the difference here in a little bit. I do think that tongue-talking is demonic, but I don't think it's satanic. Now, why is that? Because we're going to see the way Satan always works, he's always subtle. Now, what's subtle about some crazy looking rock band getting up in church and doing their head banging junk? You know, what is subtle about people passing out and going into convulsions on the floor and speaking in tongues? What's subtle about that? When Satan works, Satan always uses subtlety. It mentions right there the first thing it says now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. He got in there, he was sneaky, he was subtle, he was tricky. That's the way the devil works. And there is nothing subtle about modern day Satanism. Even the world is repulsed by satanic activity. You know, they're, they're repulsed by the animal sacrifices and things like that. The world doesn't even like that stuff. You know, and they're sacrificing cats and things like that or whatever 
crazy stuff they do. The world's repulsed by that. There's nothing subtle about that. Okay, That's demonic, but I don't believe it's necessarily satanic. Notice what else Satan did. In verse 2, the woman said to the serpent, we, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the uh, fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, God has said you should not eat of it, neither shall you touch it lest you die. And then I, I skipped the part I wanted to read, the middle of verse 1. And he said to the woman, Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. First thing he does, the Satan does, he questions the word of God. It's the first thing he does. He comes in subtly, he questions the word of God, and then he, he directly contradicts the word of God in verse 4. You know, he's like, you know, first he's like, you know, hit, you know, if God said you should not eat every tree of the garden. You know, he's questioning it. Verse 4, And the serpent said to the woman, Ye shall not surely die. That's a direct contradiction to what God said. Mm -hmm. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. He lies there. He's telling her, you know, you're going to be like God if you eat of that fruit, if you listen to me, if you do what I'm telling you to do. So he comes in subtly. He questions the word of God. Then he directly contradicts the word of God. And then notice what he uses, or what it says in verse 6, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took the fruit thereof and did eat and gave unto her husband with her and he did eat. Turn over to 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15. I'll show you a verse of scripture right there. This just shows that the devil has not changed his battle plan. He still operates the same way he always did. It says in 1 John 2.15, it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. The lust of the flesh, okay? It was a tree to be desired. I mean, it, it, it looked good. The lust of the eyes. You know, a tree to be, it was a tree to be desired to make one wise. That pride of life. The lust of the flesh. It looked good to eat. Satan had all three of those things that he used all three of those things. That looks like it'd be good to eat. Her flesh wanted that. You know, it looks good to the eyes. She was, you know, and we often do. We look at something, we see it looks good, and therefore we want it. But also the whole, he tempted her with the whole pride of life thing. Hey, you'll be as God's. If you eat this, he used the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Just like we see in 1 John, those are the things that are in the world, and we need to stay away from those things and not get caught up into those things. This is also the exact same thing that he did with Jesus. Turn to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. He's tempting him with the lust of the flesh. Jesus hasn't eaten for 40 days. He's hungry. And Satan's tempting him with the things of the flesh. He's like, you know, what would be wrong if Jesus turned the stone into bread and ate, you know, and ate? He's hungry. There's no sin in eating, but the thing is, the devil's just trying to tempt him into doing this. He's trying to get Jesus to do this to prove he's who he is instead of just, you know, the devil believing him because it's what he said. He's tempting Jesus and he's using the lust of the flesh. Now that'd be the first, that's, that's his go-to every time. The lust of the flesh. And then it says, and he answered it, um, Jesus answered it as written, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on the pinnacle of a temple and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Right here, I think he's trying to use the pride of life here. If you're really the Son of God, you know, you'd be able, if you're really him, you'd be able to jump from this pinnacle of the temple, and the angels are going to come and they're going to bear you up. He's tempting him. He's trying to test his pride. Have you ever had somebody come up to you, you know, I dare you to do this, or I don't think you can do this, or I don't think you can do that, and then what do we got to do? We got to prove it, right? We got to go show that we can do the things he said. My dad, he used to do this all the time. If there'd be two boys, you know, two brothers, he would always look at the older brother and be like, 
hey, is it true that your younger brother can beat you up? You know, and then usually that would result in the older brother proving that he was the stronger brother. And, uh, you know, just kind of, you know, tempting him, you know, me messing with him. And that's how we often are. But Jesus didn't do that. Okay, he's using the whole pride of life thing. And then verse 8, and the devil, again, the devil taketh them up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith to them, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. He's showing him all the kings, the lust of the eyes. Look at all these kingdoms. I'll give you these. You know, they'll be yours if you'll just fall down and worship me. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. That's what the devil uses. That's what he, th and let me ask you this. You know, what is, you know, where is the desire to, you know, do all the blood drinking and biting the heads off of bats and all that? You know, who wants to do that? Okay. That is not satanic. That is demonic. Okay. Satan, he does not use those things. He uses the lust of the flesh. He uses the things we would actually be interested in. Okay, I don't like cats, but I don't want to sacrifice a cat. All right, I don't, I'm not going to do a ceremony like that. I don't want to dress up in all black. I don't want to cut myself. I don't want to do all those things. You know, forget that. You know, he's not going to tempt most people with that type of thing. That is not necessarily satanic. Satan is subtle. Okay, that, that's how he works. And so... Let's look at what some things that are going on in churches today that I believe are actually satanic influences in church. Okay, we just real quickly, we just look at how the devil operates. We saw an example in Genesis. We see an example in the New Testament of how the devil operates. Look at Jude chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. So when it comes to messing up the church, all right, you know, we, we're the church of God and we're going to, you know, we're the ones that are out there trying to make a difference. If Satan is going to try to influence our church, how is he going to do it? Well, it's the same way he's always tried to influence churches. We see in Jude 1, verses 3, it says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice men crept in unawares. What does that mean? It means they came in subtly. Just like the serpent. He came in subtly. That's how they work. The false prophets came in subtly. Look at verse 16. It says, These are murmurs, complainers, walking after their own lust, And their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. Notice how they're, they're just walking after their own lust. These people are coming in, and the way they win people over, these guys are going after their own lust. Well, you know what? We're humans too. We have the same desires. We have the same lust of the flesh that the world has. And we see that, that what's happening in churches today, you've got false prophets that subtly come in, and they start introducing the things of the flesh. They start tempting people with the things of the flesh. And it ends up causing people to get away from the truth look at what it says in matthew chapter 7 verse 15 but the key here is that they come in subtly just like satan they're, they're going to be tricky they're going to be sneaky it's not going to be real noticeable at first we're not going to see something real obvious but in matthew chapter 7 verse 15 you know beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly are they ravening wolves okay why are they coming in sheep's clothing? Because they're trying to sneak in unaware. What are they trying to do? They're trying to be subtle. Who is that like? That is like Satan. Okay? Satan is subtle. The way, the way he works. Okay? These crazy, demon-possessed, tongue-talking Pentecostals, that's not subtle. Okay? If somebody comes into this church and they decide they want to start pushing tongues or something, they come in church and they start speaking in tongues during the service, there's nothing subtle about that. We're going to mark that person right away. We're going to get them out of here. We're not going to be deceived by that. That's not satanic. That's demonic. Okay? And I'll, and I'll say a little more about the demonic in, in a little bit. But look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. 
It says, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift, swift destruction, and many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. So they come in privily. Once again, subtly. They're sneaky. That's how the devil works. That is, that, that is his method. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Paul's talking here and he says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. For three years, Paul warned people and he tried to teach them how they could spot these people, how they could spot these wolves. But, and it took them three years to do this because of the fact that they're tricky, that they are sneaky, they're subtle, just like the devil. And they come in and they privily, they bring in these damnable heresies that end up destroying churches. And that, my friends, is how Satan is influencing churches. He does it subtly. He's not going to do it with this, this crazy rock and roll charismatic stuff. He's going to do it subtly. And here's what he's going to do. Look at what it says. Uh, well, what we see, you don't have to go back there, but in Genesis 3, what's the first thing that Satan did with Eve? He questioned the word of God. Okay, now this is where I might start getting a little offensive here, and I'm not trying to be offensive. But if I was to, you know, get some just crazy, just, you know, decked out in black, you know, scarred up, vampire -y looking guy and call him satanic, nobody would get offended by that. All right. But if I was to get some real nice looking, well-dressed, I mean, just polished preacher that looks, maybe looks just like me. Only he's carrying an NIV Bible and I called him satanic and I, then people would get offended, wouldn't they? Nobody's going to get offended by me calling the demon possessed guy satanic. But if I call the guy who's subtle, who's questioning the word of God and not even, not even a, you know, not even an NIV guy, but so one of these KJV guys who says, we believe in the inspiration in the originals. Yeah. Okay. You know, I'm King James, I'm only King James, but I'm not King James only, you know? Or I'm just or the guy who's King James, but he's always correcting the King James with Hebrew and Greek. Okay, the nice looking guy who's got a lot of good doctrine, if I was to get up and I was to call him satanic, a lot of people would get offended. And oh, by the way, I think those people are satanic. All right, go ahead and get offended if you want to. But these people are satanic. Why? They're subtle. They're questioning the word of God. And when you're, up, when you're up there and you're saying, well, you know, the Bible would be better translated this or that, you are directly contradicting the word of God. You are satanic. Amen. Uh, you know, I'm not foaming at the mouth and, you know, doing all these. No, but you're doing what Satan actually does. Satan, he comes in subtly. Satan questions the word of God. Satan contradicts the word of God. And what are these people doing? And not only that, when Satan is doing all this, He's, you know, he's directly going against God, but he's, at, he's, not at, he's not up there blaspheming God. He wasn't blaspheming God to Eve. He wasn't saying horrible things like they do in the satanic churches, you know, with their upside down crosses and all their things they do to just try to be offensive. Satan didn't try to be offensive and Satan doesn't try to be offen offensive. That's not how you're able to come in and privily bring in damnable heresies. Okay, there is no satanic behavior in the church of Satan. The satanic behavior is common in churches where the people call themselves Baptists, but they are contradicting, they are questioning the word of God, they are changing the word of God. That is satanic. And that's offensive. Do you hear that? Because these people look so nice. They look like one of us. Well, I've got some scripture for that. Part of that, too, is the fact that they are wolves in sheep's clothing. They're going to look like us. They are going to sound like us in many ways. 
And Satan, he didn't come in. You know, we weren't creeped out by snakes back then, okay? That was, I think that was part of the curse, being creeped out by the snakes. I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. I understand there's a spiritual application there, but I believe there was a practical application too that we're all naturally creeped out by snakes, okay? But at first they weren't. Eve wasn't startled by that. She wasn't distracted by that. And these snakes that come in, you know, we don't, they, they, look, they look right. They look the part. We're not creeped out by them. But you know what? We need to learn to get creeped out when anybody's questioning the Word of God, when anybody's changing the Word of God, because that is satanic behavior. Amen. Churches today, they would freak out if some preacher got up and he was wearing like a pentagram or, you know, some type of satanic symbol. But they don't get creeped out when he's carrying an NIV Bible. Yeah. That's what's actually satanic. But they're not bothered by that at all. They're not bothered by churches that have, you know, Star of Rim fan up on their on their platform. You know, they're they're not creeped out. They're not, you know, they're not creeped out by that stuff. You know, we ought to get creeped out by the things that are actually satanic. But people today, they're not. Oh, you know, these things look good. You know, these things, you know, these things look normal. You know, where do you see a pentagram in the Bible? You know? And I'm not saying we ought to, you know, pentagrams are okay. But we always get creeped out by these things that are supposedly satanic that we never see Satan involved with in the Bible. Okay, so, you know, keep these things in mind. Well, let's look at a few other things. Um, but, you know, Psalms chapter 12, verse 6 and 7. Let's go ahead and turn over there while I'm talking about, you know, the King James Bible and stuff like that. But it says in Psalms chapter 12, verse 6, The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times, thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Do you realize anybody who says we believe in the inspiration of the scripture in the originals and they will not acknowledge that the King James is the inspired word of God and that it's preserved, they're directly rejecting that very clear scripture right there. Right. Well, I don't believe it's the King James. Well, then please tell us which one it is. Yeah. And they never will. They will never tell you which one that they think it is. You have some of these guys, there's a few trendies out there. They don't want to call themselves King James people, but they call themselves Textus Receptus people. Well, they don't even know how to read the Textus Receptus. You know, but that's just their way of you know, allowing themselves the opportunity to correct the King James when it is necessary for them to do so. And that's satanic. Okay? That's, that's extreme using that word. Are we, have we not looked at how Satan operates and exactly what Satan does? The very first thing Satan ever did was question the word of God and contradicted the word of God. So why would I not say that people who are messing with our Bible are satanic? Preachers who get up and are rejecting what the Bible says, why would I not say they're satanic? That is actually satanic. And so, you know, you can lock it or lump it. You know, but look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Or I already read that verse. Look at, um, I lost my spot. Galatians. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 19. Galatians 5 and verse 19. Now this is an important thing to see too. So these false prophets, they come in. You know, they're wolves in sheep's clothing. They look like us. But as a result of that, you know, they're, they're questioning the word of God. And in most churches today, they're not using King James Bibles. Even in a lot of Baptist churches. They are not using King James Bibles. Look what it says in Galatians 5.19. So as a result of this, as a result of the fact that they reject the scriptures, as a result of the fact that these preachers that are coming in, they use the things of the flesh. Okay? They do this to promote the things of the flesh, just like Satan did. Okay? Look what it says in Galatians 5, verse 19. It says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. Y'all see that? Heresies. Do we not see a lot of heresy in churches today? Yes, How did that happen? It's satanic influence. It's false prophets sneaking in, false prophets coming in, messing with the word of God, and these false prophets, what are they doing? They're promoting the things of the flesh and what is the result of that? Heresies. The works of the flesh, heresies are one of those things. And the reason people fall into all this crazy doctrine, it's because these heresies, they appeal to the flesh. And we talk about this all the time, too. You know, and, it's, and it's just amazing, okay? The devil's tricky, okay? He's tricky, but he, he never has any new tricks. It's just all those old tricks repackaged. 
I think some of the biggest wolves that are coming into churches today that are bringing in heresies into the churches are people who are known for supposedly defending the King James Bible, and that's the Rockmanites. Yeah. These people are known for defending the King James Bible. So how is it, you know, that doesn't make sense. They're all about King James Bible. The Bible's a final authority. Yes, but at the same time, they're saying they're King James while teaching this dispensational garbage yep. where, you know, this doesn't apply because that's to the Jews. So, yeah, they're saying the King James translation is right, but they're getting us to basically reject the entire Old Testament, getting us to reject a lot of the New Testament because it's not in our dispensation. What do you think that is? Okay, just because they acknowledge the translation is accurate, but the fact that, you know, they acknowledge the translation is accurate, but they tell us, you know, we don't need to follow hardly anything in it. That's exactly what Satan did. Satan said, you'll not surely die. Okay, and, what, and we have all these commands that are in the Old Testament, moral things that still apply today. Uh, as for the Jews, yep. you know, we're in the New Testament era now. We don't need that anymore. Yeah, but Jesus said this. Yeah, but that was before he died on the cross. It was still under the Old Covenant then. <laughs> you know, who cares if you're King James if you're preaching that kind of garbage? Amen. Because that directly goes against what the King James Bible says. But you know what? The devil's been able to use them to infiltrate churches because people figured out that, hey, if a guy comes on with another Bible, we don't need to listen to that guy. So you know what? He did. He brought these guys in, you know, beating the drum of King James only, but bringing in dispensationalism, which basically tells us to just rip most of our Bible out and give it to the Jews. Not, not even for us. That is satanic. Okay? And don't let, don't let them fool you by that type of behavior. And so, I'll look at verse 16, okay? And, and how, why, why do they hate the Old Testament stuff so much? Why do they hate that moral law so much? Why do they hate it so much that we still like Leviticus 20.13? You know, why does that bother even the Rukmanites so much? Why are they so bothered by what the Bible teaches about reprobates? Why does that, why does that make them so mad? Well, because, once again, that Old Testament, it goes against our flesh, doesn't it? It absolutely goes against our flesh. And what did it teach in Jude? You know, these people, they're coming in, they're, they're turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. These people, you know, they're, they're, they're using the things of the flesh to try to win people over. Verse, like we read in verse uh, 16 of Jude chapter 1, these are murmurs, complainers, walking after their own lusts. And it's amazing too, all these people too, the, the Ruckmanite world is also known for just making divorce acceptable for pastors. Mm -hmm. Well, that makes sense if you're about the lust of the flesh. That absolutely makes sense if you're about that, but it directly goes against what the Bible teaches. Yet these people are known for it. The greatest heroes, Ruckman himself, you know, married multiple times, divorced multiple times. Schofield, their, their main guy where it all started from, you know, divorced and, and remarried, abandoned his first wife and kids. I mean, that's the type of people that they follow after and whose teachings that they promote. These th why are they doing these things? It is about the lust of the flesh. And you know what? People in churches are going to gravitate towards that because we're all about the lust of the flesh. Yeah. And many of us, you know, we're really, even a lot of saved people are really bad at walking in the spirit. And as a result of that, we are easily manipulated by the things of the flesh. Hey, that sounds good. I'm glad, you know, you know, we can get rid of our wives and get a new one. Great. You know, mine's annoying. You know, mine's an egg. That, you know, that sounds wonderful. A lot of people are going to be for that. A lot of people are, you know, for going against these moral laws and things like that. But you know what? I'm telling you, that type of teaching, it is, it's satanic. And everything we see in the Bible, it's not like what you see in your church of Satan, but it's like the Satan that we actually see in the Bible, that's what he's really like, okay? He's not this crazy, evil-looking devil with fangs and horns and a tail and a pitchfork. That is not what he looks like, okay? That is a Hollywood version. And so church today, it's all about just giving people what they want. That's what, that's what they're all about. So what about all these rock and roll churches? You know, what about, what about the church where they got the rock music and stuff going on? What about these Hillsong churches and these Willow Creek churches? What about these Pentecostal tongue-talking churches? You saying Satan's not involved there? 
Well, I personally don't think Satan is involved in those churches. Because here's what we see with Satan, all right? So after Satan comes into the garden, he gets Adam and Eve to fall. He goes on his merry way. He leaves. And now they are left to deal with their sin. And you know they're left to deal with the consequences of that sin. They end up going on their way, and they end up having two boys. Two boys that now have a sin nature. One of them ends up killing his own brother. Okay, That is the effects of allowing Satan in your life, and now they're dealing with the consequences. That wasn't Satan that did that. That was just, you know, Cain, that was Cain's sinful nature. Okay, And we see that I personally believe these churches that are like that, that's what ends up happening after Satan comes in and has his way. After he comes in, if he can get us questioning the word of God, if he can get us changing our Bible, then if he can get us doing the things of the flesh, it's only a matter of time, and we will end up going after all those things. Because what I believe those things are, I believe those, when after Satan has his way, he goes and he does his thing, and then it's like he just sicks his demons on us. He sicks the demons and devils after us, the unclean spirits. I believe there's, I, I think there's a difference in those. And so we don't, we don't, we never see Satan trying to get people to do vile, perverted things. That's what the devils and the, you know, the demons and the unclean spirits do. They do those things. Satan causes us to fall and then he leaves us to deal with the consequences. The devil, the unclean spirits, those are what the crazy horror movie stuff's all about. All right. Satan, he's, he doesn't need to waste his time in the church of Satan, okay? Those people are already in big trouble. Those people are already done for. The devils, the, the demons are already having their way with those people. Yeah. Satan doesn't need to be any part of that. And the truth is, you know, I think Satan likes having that there because, you know, that, once again, you know, he's, he's a master of deception, okay? He wants us looking at all that crazy stuff and saying that's the satanic stuff. You know, he doesn't want us looking at some guy that's all clean cut in a suit and an NIV Bible is satanic. That's the guy that's really doing the damage. Okay? You know, those are the people that are really, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay? They look great, don't they? Mm -hmm. They're nice looking, well dressed, clean cut people. Sa you know, Satan's not going to, he's not going to want them to get 666 tattooed on their forehead. Nobody's going to listen to them if they come to their door like that. If they come all dressed up in goth and in black and you know, black fingernails and you know, white makeup and stuff like that, you know, nobody's going to listen to those people if they do that. That is, not how Satan, that is not how Satan works. But that's what the demons and what the unclean spirits do. That, that's, what, that's what they do. After they get a hold of them, it's like he just turns them, he turns them over to the dogs. He turns them over to these filthy things. Because think about this too, and I don't, I don't know all the ins and outs. I don't understand everything when it comes to the unclean spirits and demons and things like that and, and all their origins and things. But I do know with the devil, we know that he was an anointed, he was an anointed cherub yeah. in the Bible. He was a heavenly being. He was a beautiful being. And uh, I said, I personally don't think he's that interested in doing the perverted stuff. That's something that, that's more about the devils and the unclean spirits. He's going to do these. He's going to use the things that ultimately took him down. Okay, go ahead. Turn over to Isaiah chapter fourteen. Isaiah chapter fourteen. And this now this is important. This is what I want you to see. Okay, this is where we're kind. We're just kind of kind of be a twist here in a little bit. But Isaiah fourteen verse twelve says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation of the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be my, like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. What was Satan's goal? It was to be like the most high. Where is the desire of Satan here to just be vile and dirty and perverted? Okay, S Satan, he got lifted up with pride because of his beauty, because of just all the great things that there were about him. He ended up getting lifted up with pride, and he wanted a position that was not his. It was not what God gave him. He was, uh, and so as a result of that, he didn't even say it out loud. He just said it in his heart. And as a result of that, 
He ended up falling. He ended up getting kicked out of heaven. And I believe Satan, he uses the same, the same thing that got him kicked out of heaven as one of the main things he uses with us, pride. Okay? We mentioned the whole pride of life thing. He uses those things to tempt us and to get us to fall. That's what made him fall. But notice okay, what Satan wanted. Satan said, I will be like the Most High. Who's that talking about? Okay, that's talking about Jesus Christ. Satan, Lucifer, wanted Jesus' spot. But guess what? He wasn't going to get it. He couldn't get it. And so having said all what we've been saying about you know, Satan and how he works, what, what do we think the real church of Satan would look like? Okay? What would the real church of Satan actually look like? Is it going to be that, you know, Anton LaVey type stuff that we hear about? Or would it be a religion where Satan is Jesus? Would it be a religion where Satan has taken his place? Like he, isn't that not what he wanted in Isaiah chapter 14? Yeah. I will be like the Most High. I will ascend. I will, I will do all these things. He wanted Jesus' spot. And so in other words, the religion where Satan has taken the place of Christ would be the real religion of Satan. Where he's taken, and if it's the religion where he's taken the place of Christ, what does the Bible call it? It calls that Antichrist. Mm -hmm. Okay? Another Christ. Or in place of Christ. So this is not going to be a religion that normal people are disgusted by. But it's going to be one that will be loved by the world. And it's going to be one that I believe the Bible calls the synagogue of Satan. What does it say in Revelation? Talk about those who say they are Jews but are not but do lie that are in the synagogue of Satan. Amen. You want to know what the real church of Satan looks like? It's got a star of David, as they call it, or a star of Remphan over it. It is a religion that our world greatly respects, that Baptist churches are today are greatly promoting, in many cases because of dispensationalism, yeah. like we talked about. Okay? These guys who have been coming in supposedly promoting a King James Bible are the biggest, most pro-Jew people in all the world. And that, my friends, that is the real synagogue of Satan. That is the real church of Satan. We, we've got to stop looking at these crazy snake handling, you know, bite the head off a of bat churches. And we've got to start looking, you know, those aren't the satanic ones. Those are a distraction for the real Satanists. Turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. It said, at best, those people are people whose lives have already been destroyed and they've just been turned over to the unclean spirits of the world. The real bad guys don't look like bad guys. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13 says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. What does it say there? His, their, his ministers are going to be transformed into ministers of righteousness. Is that what they're, is that, does anybody think what the satanic church does is righteous in their, you know, all their crazy things they do? No, Satan transforms his ministers into ministers of righteousness. They're going to look like good guys. They're going to look like nice people. But these are people who are wanting to take the place of Jesus Christ. That is what's actually satanic. And back to Bill Schnoblin. I, I mentioned Bill Schnoblin. I think I'm saying his name right. This guy, the last time I saw him on a video, the guy wears a yarmulke. What? Yeah. And he calls Jesus Yeshua. And, I'm, I'm, and I remember I'm reading that book, you know, and it's so neat. You know, you see him come to the Christian faith and all that stuff and him, him get saved and everything. But at the same time, this is his book that he's written, you know. And I was... I so said, I'm, I'm watching that and I'm listening to him talk about Yeshua and, and he's like reading his Bible. And when he's reading his Bible, it was one of these Bibles. I saw one of these one time. We were looking for a Bible for somebody and I forgot what it's called exactly, but they've got these Bibles. They're, they're King James Bibles. I'm not sure that this is the one he had, but they've changed all the names of God into the Hebrew 
versions. You know, so it'll be like you know, Ad, you know, Adonai and Yahweh and Yeshua, and he was doing that. He's reading these passages from the Bible, and he's changing the names of God into all these Hebrew words. He's calling Jesus Yeshua. He's just, I mean, promoting Israel, praising Israel like crazy. And you know, that's the, that's still satanic right there. That guy is pushing satan uh, a Hebrew roots agenda that a lot of this stuff it com it comes out of Judaism, this modern Judaism that has nothing to do with the Old Testament. I'm like this, unfortunately, this guy's still satanic. The, and that would offend so many people. That will offend, you know, chick publications. They put out a lot of his stuff. They refer to a lot of his things in their chick tracks. But I'm telling you, that guy's still satanic. So, you know, and if you read the beginning of his book, the beginning of his book starts out talking about, you know, how he had this thirst for blood and he was like a vampire and he'd suck blood and all this kind of stuff. You know, nobody's offended when you call that satanic, but when you call him, you know, when he, because he's wearing a yarmulke and he's got a big, long Jewish beard and, you know, he's calling Jesus Yeshua, you say that's satanic, people will get offended by that, but that's actually satanic. That's more satanic than what he was doing before because now he's pretending to be a minister of righteousness. Now he's pretending to be promoting Christ and he's promoting a false version of it. That is more dangerous. If he was back to sucking blood, people are going to be creeped out by him and nobody's going to be listening to him. But that is what's actually satanic. And we're seeing this stuff. It is in churches today. I watched a video just this week. A guy is in church showing Bible code stuff. Mickey Carter, okay, a well-known speaker in Baptist churches, he preaches at the Revival Fires Conference every year that I've gone to that I've gone to many times. I've heard the guy preach before. He gets up and he's showing Bible code stuff. And if you don't know what Bible code stuff is, you're not missing anything. But all for you to be able to figure out Bible code stuff, you got to know Hebrew. Well, guess where they learned all this? You know who figures out all these codes? It's Jews. It's people that know that know Hebrew. And it's like, really, you're going to listen to a bunch of people who can't even figure out that Jesus is the Messiah, and you're going to let them figure out all this, you know, convince you all this Bible code stuff's true. I can't verify it because I don't know Hebrew. And even if I did, they don't even write it out like Hebrew is. It's all weird the way they have it written out. And it's funny. They're always finding out that the Bible predicted all these things, you know, years before, but they never figure out that the Bible predicted it until after it happens. They, they, they never do. And it's like, you know, if it was really legit, they would be showing us this stuff. He, Mickey Carter was showing this stuff about Trump and, you know, 2016. And I, I can't remember all the things, but it was all these things supposedly just showing Trump was going to be president and everything. It was like, you know, I would have been impressed if 20 years ago you would have showed that. But even then, you know, sa Satan could use that too. But at least that would be impressive. Okay? But anybody can go back and make things fit. And let me tell you, too, all these crazy dispensationalists, and he's a hardcore dispensationalist, all these crazy dispensationalists are all into the numerology and all that weird stuff. It's the Jews that have promoted a lot of that junk. It was the Jews that would always get caught up in those kind of things. And Baptists today are listening to these people. They're listening to it, not understanding that what they are promoting and teaching is satanic in the most satanic way possible. They would never let, you know, somebody who's from the church of Satan, you know, they, they would never refer to their materials, but they will from Jews. Mm -hmm. Why? Because some dispensationalists told us that they're still God's chosen people. Yeah. And so they will allow them to, you know, advance their satanic agenda. The, a people who say that Jesus is not the Messiah, that the Messiah is still to come. That there is no doubt that these people are waiting for Satan. And, and even most Baptists will admit that, that the Antichrist, the Jews are going to follow after him. And it's going to be Satan that they're following after. But for some messed up reason, they're still for advancing these people and promoting them and wanting to help them get their temple built and all this stuff, wanting to help advance a satanic agenda. And... We've got to understand, we've got to stop getting caught up into these things and falling for this, these distractions like the church of Satan. Okay? 
and the Satanic Bible and all. If you want to know what the Satanic Bible really looks like, you know, look at the Kabbalah. You know, yeah. look at stuff where Judaism actually comes from. Yes, Don't look at Anton LaVey's book. You know, look at things like that. That's where a lot of this junk is coming from. A lot of this garbage is coming from. And we've got, you know, you would think as Bible believers, we would be able to spot Satanism a little better, but we don't. We think it's that crazy bite the head off, or, you know, bite a bat's head off stuff. And we don't think it's like what the Bible actually shows, where Satan transforms himself into an angel of light. He will transform his ministers into ministers of righteousness. And so how do we spot them? They look like the real thing. Here's why. They're going to come in subtly. And so, the, you know, the subtleness is going to be hard to spot. But what we can spot is when they start messing with the scriptures. Yeah. And just because a guy says he's King James doesn't mean he's messing with the script, doesn't mess with the scriptures. When he's promoting dispensationalism, he's messing with the scriptures big time. In many cases, worse than a lot of NIVers do. At least a lot. There's a lot of people that use an NIV that believe in the Old Testament. You know, but the, a lot of these dispensationalists don't. And we've got we've to learn to spot who the real satanic people are so we can make sure we keep these satanic influences out of our church. Because if we do, if we allow these satanic influences in our church, once Satan has his way and God removes our candlestick and he doesn't have anything to do with our church anymore, we will eventually just go to the things of the flesh. And I believe we will be wide open for the demonic stuff in churches like the rock music, the tongue talking, and all those crazy things. That's what, that's what we'll get turned over to after Satan has his way with us. He'll, then he'll stick his demons on us. And so when you see these crazy, you know, Pentecostal tongue-talking churches, the rock and roll churches, understand that's what happens after Satan has his way yeah. with a church. When Satan's actually involved in a church, it's going to look more like the real thing at first. But then, as soon as he has his way, and people are questioning the word of God, and, not, and the Bible's not the final authority anymore, then he'll turn us over to those things. And that's what we need to watch out for. Mm -hmm. We should never let anybody come in here and question the word of God, doubt the word of God, try to get us to take part of the Bible and say that's not for us. We should never let that happen. We shouldn't let some guy get up here and say, I'm King James, or, but I only believe in the inspiration in the originals. We're not going to do that. We're not going to allow anything satanic into this church. That includes pentagrams, Star of Rem fans, upside down crosses and NIV Bibles. Amen. And so we those are satanic and we're going to we're going to spot those things for what they are and keep them out of this church. And so I hope that was helped you with let's, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your goodness to us. Lord, and I pray you'll help us to spot these things, dear God. I pray that we will that we'll be in the scriptures, we'll know the scriptures, we'll have a love for the scriptures so when somebody comes along and they're contradict contradicting the scriptures, we'll spot them for what they really are but one of Satan's ministers who's transformed themselves into a minister of righteousness. And I pray that we'll keep these satanic influences out of our church so we uh, will not be in, eventually be turned into one of these demonic churches that are out there. I pray you'll just help us, Lord, uh, in these things. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, let's go.